And the Buddha taught breath meditation to his son, Rahula. He prefaced his teachings with some contemplations, groundwork for breath meditation. One of the contemplations is not self, which may seem surprising because we usually think of the not self teaching as something that's designed for the last stages of the path. And it is true when, that when the Buddha taught people to let go of everything, to learn to identify nothing as self. He was speaking largely to people who were on the verge of becoming arahants, people who had followed the path, all the activities of the path, and now were ready to let go of those activities and any sense of self that lingered around them, to reach a state of mind that was beyond activity. But at the beginning of the path, it's useful to have a reflection on that self, too, in a more selective way. In brief, the Buddha is trying to get us to see our sense of self as an activity. We do identify with things, and our sense of identity changes all the time. We pick up something and identify with it, and then we may drop it in favor of something else. It's the dropping. Not selfing is also an activity. And you want to learn how to see how it happens. All too often we don't, because we're moving on to the next sense of self and then the next. What happens in the process of letting go of something you used to identify with? That's something you want to look into and take advantage of as you meditate. Because, of course, as you're sitting here, you could take on lots of different identities. The identity you want right now is the identity of a meditator, an earnest meditator. You're here really trying to get some results from what you're doing. But there are a lot of other identities lurking in the background. The identity of you at work, the identity of you at home, the identity of you as a feeder as an enjoyer of sensual pleasures, all kinds of things that you could take on right now. For the time being, at least, you have to learn how to not self those identities. See that they're not worth taking on. Because that's what the whole idea of self and not self is based on. It's not so much a metaphysical issue for most of us. And in terms of what the Buddha wants us to look at, he wants to see it as a value judgment. Is this particular self worth taking on, or is it not? Is a particular identity something that's really worth following through? And that goes together with the actions of that identity that you take on when you assume that identity. Are they worth it? And this is something we're doing all the time. I was talking this morning with someone who was commenting on how the not-self teaching seemed very rarefied. I said, look, you're not selfing all the time. As you take on an identity, say at work, and even when you're at work, you can drop your work identity. As you start thinking about other things that are not related to your work, and then you take it back on again when you realize you've you got to get work done. And as with every issue of craving and clinging, which the sense of self is in, tied up in, when the Buddha talks in terms of the Third Noble Truth, he says he wants you to see the mind as it lets go of craving and to realize the good things that come about when you let go of that craving. But again, we're so wound up in, usually when we let go of one craving, we're wound up in moving on to the next and the next, and so we don't see the process of letting go. So as, a as you meditate, and this is why this is a preliminary contemplation, you want to get good at that ability to realize you've taken on an identity and it's not something you want. You have better identities. So if you find yourself suddenly wandering off into the past, into a little thought world, well, pull yourself out. This ability to pull out of an identity 
is a lot of what not-self is about, pulling out of those thought worlds. That's a lot of what not-self is about. You see that the thought world isn't worth it. And of course, there'll be a voice in the mind that says, yes, it is. And it's gaining a sense of values. This is what the not-self teaching is focused on, is what is your sense of values? What's important for you? What identities do you want to develop? Which identities are worth developing? This is why the Buddha has us look at the arising of a sense of self and the passing away of a sense of self, and also at the allure of a particular sense of self, and then the drawbacks, so we can get beyond it. That's the same pattern he has us adopt for every activity. Skillful and unskillful. There are times when you drop unskillful activities for the sake of skillful ones, and then you drop certain skillful activities because you want to move on to something even more skillful. When you get a sense of fluidity around this, then you learn how to do it more skillfully. And if you find yourself stuck in a bad identity, you know there are ways of getting yourself out. So when the Buddha is teaching not self as a preliminary activity, it's like when they teach you Thai boxing. The first thing they teach you is how to back away from your opponent without exposing yourself to his kicks. In other words, the retreat is the first thing you want to learn. Because you're going to be sitting here meditating, focused on the breath, and all of a sudden the breath seems far away and you're in some other thought world. You want to be quick to recognize that and quick to see the disadvantages of staying with that thought world. And then letting go. There are other identities, of course, that you want to develop. You're sitting here as a meditator, you want to be a good meditator. When you're at work, you want to be a good worker. If you're part of a team, you want to be a good member of the team. In other words, realize that the identities you take on are choices that you make. You want to ask yourself, what choices will be for your long-term welfare and happiness? When you start thinking of selfing as an activity, you realize that it fits right in with the Buddha's teachings on karma. Basic wisdom is, what when I do it will lead to my long-term welfare and happiness. We'll insert the term, what way of selfing will lead to my long-term welfare and happiness? What will lead to my long-term harm and suffering? That's the beginning of wisdom. So learn to see the choice of self, which you take on an identity, either as the potential consumer of some happiness or as the person with the skills and abilities to bring that happiness about. See all this as a type of activity, as a type of karma. Then ask yourself, when is it skillful when is it not? When is it worth doing when is it not? Again, not self is a value judgment. The Buddha is not asking you to draw conclusions about whether there is a self in the larger metaphysical sense or not, when he, even when he's talking to the arahants, or the people about to be arahants, and giving them that questionnaire, form, feeling, perceptions, fabrications, consciousness. Are they constant or inconstant? They're inconstant. If they're inconstant, are they easeful or stressful? Well, they're stressful. And then the final question is not a question of asking, it, then is there a self? No, it's the question is, are they worth holding on to as claiming or holding on to a self? Or is being claimed as me or mine? It's a value judgment. So get your values straight around which of your identities you want to take on, which ones you don't. Learn to see your identity as something fluid and moving, changing its shape all the time, like an amoeba. Sometimes looking like a horse, sometimes looking like a human being, sometimes looking like a deva. Sometimes looking just like a mouth with a lot of teeth. Years back when I was in Japan, there was a cartoon character. It was called the Children's Police. A little tiny fat guy. 
and his face was extremely malleable. He, was, he seemed to be just pure id. And whatever emotion was going through him, it would change his shape, the shape of his face. If he was angry, his nose would turn into a gun. If he was feeling lust, his nose got obscene. And we tend to think of ourselves as just being us. Our body doesn't change shape that much as we go through the day. But if you looked at your sense of self, you'd find it changing shape all over the place, extending little pseudopods here or there. So it's good to see your sense of self as fluid, and then ask yourself, how can I mold it in a way that's going to be helpful? for long-term welfare and happiness. It's when you learn to think in these terms that you will eventually get to the point where you don't need a, self, a sense of self anymore. That's when you get to that ultimate level where you found a happiness that doesn't require anything more to be done. But in the meantime, learn a good sense of values around self and not self. Because having that sense of values will really help you on the path.